Today I want to talk to you about retro computing. Now, retro computing is one of my hobbies, and the first question you might have is, well, what is it? Well, this is a hobby that now an increasingly large number of people have, where they take older computers, computers that might have been culturally significant or technologically significant, and restore them, collect them, uh, develop software for them, or reverse engineer them. In many cases, older computers have now had new hardware developed for them, add-on cards and boards that add new capabilities, or had new software written for them, everything from operating systems to applications, and the most popular category, of course, is games. Now, you might wonder, why would somebody involved in cutting-edge technology in a field like artificial intelligence, which is all about the latest GPUs and the latest ASICs and DPUs and you know new algorithms that are coming out almost, it seems like, every week, uh, why would a person that uh, has built a career around these modern technologies be interested in retro computing? And the reason for this is that old computers open your eyes to how things really function on a first principles basis. So for example, let's take a home computer from the 1980s. Let's take the Commodore 64 or the IBM PC running DOS. Now, the IBM PC running DOS had a very simple operating system that basically uh, you know, loaded a minimal system into memory, a few routines that helped you access the keyboard, that might help you access system time, that may help you write things to the screen, but pretty much that was about it with some basic memory access. And the operating system didn't really implement much in the way of security, which is a big deal in today's operating systems. Now, that's an advantage because if you want to put a system on the internet today, you obviously want to have sophisticated identity management, authentication, and security, memory management, and all of these types of things. But older computers had none of this. And so the advantage that they have is that you are very close to the hardware when you're using something like an IBM PC running DOS. You have direct access to memory. You don't have any operating system elements uh, intruding. You don't have any special permissions to get. If you want to write something to the screen, for example, you simply look at the memory map and you see where the video RAM is and you start writing bytes to that address in memory. Nothing stops you from doing that. And suddenly those characters appear on a screen. If you want to access the registers of a CPU, if you want to access the parallel port, if you want to access the serial port, ultimately the parallel port and serial port are also memory mapped. So again, you access a place in memory and you place bytes or read bytes from that location and now you are exchanging data on the parallel port or on the serial port. So video, all the ports are directly memory mapped and you have access to all of this. And again, nothing is preventing you from switching out or changing values in any of the registers of the CPU. So you can do all of this and you're extremely close to the hardware. One of the benefits of this is that this really allows you to understand how computers work. And in addition to giving you an architectural sense of how everything comes together, another thing that it does is it makes you very performance aware. For example, Let's say that you used the most common programming language on a Commodore 64, which is BASIC. The moment you turn on a Commodore 64, it boots up almost instantly, and it gives you a BASIC prompt. Now, if you wanted to write a program that draws lines on the screen or draws a little car and moves that car across the screen, and you did that in BASIC, you can definitely accomplish that task. But the Commodore 64 basically had a 1 megahertz 6502 processor one megahertz compared to, let's say, four gigahertz uh, that uh, today's processors operate on. That's a 4,000 times difference. So when you do this type of animation in a language like BASIC on the Commodore 64, you see a very slow progression of the object moving painfully pixel by pixel across the screen. But that same Commodore 64, if you now write that routine in assembly language, you will see a many times speed up and you'll suddenly start to see smooth animation. 
So the value of low-level programming and the value of, for example, uh, not using something that's interpreted, which BASIC is an interpreted language, and being very, very close to the hardware, that value is instantly visible to you. And it's actually possible for a programmer, even uh, a, a child or a teenager back in the 80s, it was possible for them to actually understand things at that level and write code at that level. Many of the things that you now find in modern operating systems and modern languages, let's take an example of garbage collection. The idea that when you create an object in memory, when you're no longer using it, that that object should be purged from memory and memory should be freed. Well, in languages like C, when you allocated uh, memory for an object, this was done manually. And when you wanted to deallocate that memory or free that memory, that task also was manual. Now, of course, this led to many problems, uh, memory leaks as an example, where you forgot to free up memory after you were done with that block or that data structure that resided in memory. But at the same time, it also explained to you how memory worked. And you were connected to the low-level elements of random access memory and how the memory map works, as an example. So you could also do a lot of tricks. For example, you can, you can have two processes access the same memory location and exchange data as long as both of them kind of knew what they were doing. You could set up your own semaphores or flags that indicated whether one area of memory was being used by one process or another, and they could share that same memory and communicate directly using that common memory. These are all things that with the modern protections in most programming languages and also in modern operating systems are now becoming harder to do. But in the earlier days of computing, this was all very commonplace and fostered an understanding at a basic architectural level that many programmers who have grown up with more modern technologies might lack. So another benefit of retro computing, other than just simply reliving childhood memories and having fun with old games that you might have enjoyed growing up, is that it brings you back closer to the hardware. And the complexity of the overall system, both at the hardware level and at the software level, is such that you can, as one person, understand everything. And you can really put things together at the system level as one individual containing all the ideas necessary in your mind and really developing a sense of how all of this works. Now, that becomes a great basis on which to then take these modern concepts, layer on these modern concepts, but really have a clear understanding of first principles. Another reason why retrocomputing is very interesting is because the, the possibilities with low-power hardware, slower hardware, were not fully understood when these systems initially came out. The possibility of what you can do with, for example, a 4.77 megahertz 8088 processor, which ran on the IBM PC, were not fully explored back in the day. Even today, there are programmers on what's called the demo scene. The demo scene is where programmers that are very interested in developing graphics demos get together and create really compelling, almost magical software experiences that showcase tricks and that showcase uh, performance and that showcase things that you would otherwise consider the platform to not be able to do. But with programming tricks, all of this becomes possible. And this group of people takes real pride in being able to showcase what was previously impossible, but now through their software, it becomes possible. So with the demo scene, there's still a very large community that's very active in developing programs that showcase uh, performance that we've never seen on an 8088. Um, you know, again, graphical sequences that we never thought could occur on an 8088 or an IBM PC class system. And some of the most magical of these demos have only now appeared a few years ago. The IBM PC is 40 years old and some of the coolest software written for it is only five years old, which is amazing, which says that the perfection, the mastery of a tool takes a long period of time. The mastery of hardware is being able to write software for it that really exercises every ounce of potential in that hardware and manifests the capabilities of that hardware in the fullest way possible. 
And this is only now becoming possible. So this idea of thinking of computer hardware as a tool, as an instrument that you take a long time to master, and in mastering it and having this artisanal, craftsman-like approach to the hardware, what becomes possible? And if you take that approach now to more modern hardware, what could become possible? So the other reason why I like uh, retro computing and why I take great joy in it is because, again, it brings the craftsmanship out. It makes you innovate under constraints. And that, to me, is real magic because nothing in life is unconstrained. The universe is not unconstrained. Resources are not unconstrained. There are constraints that we live with at all times. And art, in, in some sense, is creativity under constraint. So for me, retro computing bridges these two ideas, innovation and creativity under constraint and the practical mastery to realize that.